Hi, I'm David Wharton uh, from the University of New South Wales and uh, I'm on the editorial board for Methods in Ecology and Evolution and um, what we're going to, the, the idea is to do a series of interviews basically ripping off Scott, Scott Chamberlain from Journal of Ecology because uh, we like the idea. I'm here to interview Trevor Hasty from Stanford. Th thanks for doing the interview Trevor. Oh, you're it's, welcome. So um, I guess one thing I wanted to talk about, like it was, it's related to a paper that's in press at the moment in ecography. Uh, so it was, uh, I think the title was about presence only data, the ongoing controversy. Yeah, I thought it was, a, it was an interesting paper, and it makes makes a quite a good point. Um, so I was just wondering if you could explain to um, to us uh, basically what the idea of the paper was. So the idea of the paper is as, as follows. Um, let me let me put it in context. Um, you know, when we, get, when we get data, say, on a pair of variables and we want to uh, model their relationship, um, we don't a priori think that the relationship's linear, let's say, but we do use linear regression. So what are we doing there? Well, we, we know the underlying function can be anything, and usually it's definitely not going to be linear, um, but with a small amount of data, we fit a linear model, and we think of that as an approximation to the true function. As we got more and more data, we could actually fit more flexible models, um, but the linear model is still approximating the, the true underlying function. And so there, the, the linear model assumption is just, it's a useful assumption, it's just making an approximation to something that we could estimate if we had lots of data more flexibly. In this, in this, in this context of this paper, it's really different. What you have is, you have a sample of, from a presence population, which is one distribution, and then you have a sample from a background distribution. And even if those sample, even if we had a massive amount of data from each of those distributions, we could, we could not estimate the conditional probability of the presence um, given the, the, the features um, because we're missing an ingredient, and that ingredient is the, is the overall prevalence. It's just not there, and no matter how much data we had, uh, were given, we wouldn't be, that's not available to us. So there's something missing in the data. So what's happened in, 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 in this approach that's used in, in the paper, the Royal et al. paper that we discuss, is they rely on the linear assumption in their model. And they're not using the linear assumption to approximate the truth in that case, they're using the linear assumption to give them some leverage to create this piece of missing data. And that's really dangerous and bad, you know. There's information's not in the data, and so now you build, you, you put a restrictive assumption on your model as a way to try and squeeze out some, some information that you don't have. And we try to demonstrate that in the paper, that that's, that's really dangerous. Okay. I'm not sure if that captures what... <laughs> yeah. No, that, that makes sense. Um, I guess... Um, I guess there's kind of, in the max-like approach, I guess one thing that flags that maybe there's something going on is, is the uncertainty estimates. Like, um, I think in the Andy Royal Tail, the Royal Tail simulations, they showed that you, you can estimate uh, prevalence um, if the model's correct. Uh, but there was, there was a fair standard error sort of yes. involved in the estimate. So is that kind of... Well, that's always a warning when, you, yeah. when there's a parameter that's that's got a, a very large standard error when you try to estimate it. That, that's usually telling you it's, it's nearly not identifiable. Right? So you'd be a little suspicious about your modeling process. Um, now, it is true that in this context, if you, if you start off and say, I have a, a linear model, that the model's linear, the model that generated the data is linear, that, uh, that you can tease out this, uh, this baseline um, prevalence, but it, your ability to do so hinges entirely on the fact that you're assuming that your model's correct. Now, you know, you never want to start off in, in statistical modeling, you know, assuming that your model's correct. You know, if everything hinges on the fact that your model's correct, you're not likely to get good information out. Fair enough. Um, so I guess, I guess another question is kind of taking a step back. Um, so you've, you've been doing a bit of work in ecology recently, sort of publishing some, some papers in ecography. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I was just wondering where it came from. Oh. 
Well, it, it all started in, in 2001. I was invited to a, a conference in, in Greater Alp in Switzerland. Right. And, so, and they were using generalized additive models, mm -hmm. right, to model species um, abundance and, and, and presence. And it's a lovely place. If anyone's not been to Greater Alp, they should try and get there. It's this nature center up on the top of the mountain. It's the first conference I've ever been to where you had to hike part of the way to get to the conference center. So, so I went there, and I, I really enjoyed the, the community, the ecologists, a very lively uh, bunch of people, and they use a lot of statistics. And, uh, you know, so I was, I was intrigued. And uh, they wanted me to come there and talk about generalized additive models, but actually I'd moved on, and I, I actually talked about boosting models and more flexible ways of, of modeling. And, uh, and then I, you know, I gradually got to learn about some of these problems, and I made some good colleagues. Um, in particular, um, Jane Elith and, uh, and John Lethwick, and now you, and, and lots of others. And so it's, it's a nice place to, it's a nice community for, um, you know, for developing and, uh, statistical technology, because it's really needed in this community, statistics. Right? And most ecologists I know are eager users of, of statistical methodology. And, uh, you know, but there's, uh, there's some nuances in that that one has to be careful of. And so I think statisticians have a role as well in, mm -hmm. in, in, in keeping things straight and, and, and so on. Yeah, so I guess something I've found sort of looking across stats and ecology is all the, that I think there's a lot of opportunities out there in terms of things that can be done. Yeah. Um, and I guess, um, do you have sort of anything that's on your, on your hit list? Well, since I've, I've currently got a really good student, Will Fithian, who is a co-author of my talk today and of a paper that we published, we, we actually, we're planning to work with Jane Elith on the problem of trying to separate out the, um, the, um, the bias, you know, in, in presence-only data, you know, so to separate out the components of the, um, the, the occurrence rate and the, the observation rate. And, and, and try and tease that apart, maybe through multiple species and mm. perhaps other information that we can bring to bear. Yeah, so right. that's one of the things we, we plan to work with. Um, and I know we're also interested in this idea of um, the, the, the Poisson process model assumes independence, and mm. that's probably rarely true. Mm. And so that's something I, I just at lunchtime I've been hearing that people have other approaches for that, so I'm keen to to find out more about that as well. Fair enough. Yeah, it sounds interesting. We'll, yeah. we'll keep an eye on it. Okay. So, uh, well, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>